Hello and welcome to the first episode of whatever I end up calling this show. I'm sure it's in the title of the video. Harry Potter is a worldwide phenomenon, from the incredible books to the awesome movies. But with all worldwide phenomena of the early 2000s, there was also a slew of video games. Who wouldn't want to be Harry Potter in the magical wizarding world, right? You're a wizard, Harry. So, with the imminent, or already past, this may come out late, release of the latest from the magical world of Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, I thought we'd look at these games for our first foray into the world of online video entertainment. In this video we will look at the games linked to the first four films. The games linked to the final four films will be looked at in yet another episode of this show, because I left this far too late and need an extra week to create the final part of the video. These videos will also only cover the main games published by Yay, so none of that Lego shit here, okay? So, without further ado, shall we begin? So first things first, let's talk about the rampant danger of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. When it comes to the movies and books, it's nothing new to talk about the incredible danger of the school, with its yearly peril and giant monsters looking to murder the students. However, the games by and far present the most dangerous version of Hogwarts. Throughout all four games, we're looking at an incredibly dangerous place to be. In the first game, Harry Potter and the Philosopher, Oh, um, Sorcerer's Stone for the PC, it by far features the most dangerous version of the Hogwarts grounds. Giant fire-breathing turtles? Yeah, we got tons of those. An infestation of poisonous fairies? Yep, they're here too. Oh, that's not dangerous enough for you. How about poisonous Venus flytraps and spiky bushes that explode and shoot spikes at you? Even to get to Hagrid's cabin requires traversing dangerous ravines and death-defying jumps. Oh, and there's fiery trees that will also just kill a student if they get too close. By the other games, the grounds get far less dangerous. However, the dangers in the inside of the castle increase dramatically. The fourth game depicts a Hogwarts eternally on fire, with dangerous salamanders waiting to kill him. In fact, fiery monsters seem to inhabit the school in all the games. From the fiery crabs of the second game, to the fiery torches... Huh. Torches, that seems a little lazy. There is always a danger of a student burning to death. Get out of the way! Beyond this, there are other dangers to contend with as well. The third game, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban for PS2, depicts, depicts a school occupied by dangerous dwarf-like creatures called Redcaps. Go the wrong way to a lesson, or go too, too deep into the dungeons, and they will just club you to death. Sentient invaders also seem to be rampant in the Goblet of Fire. The sewers are apparently the domain of these things. They look like walking shrubs. Or more like sticks, actually. Spiky stick people. They try to kill students with bows and arrows, and also, also seem to be all about getting up close and personal too. Think that's bad? Well, there's also the paranormal to contend with in Peeves the Ghost. Uh -oh, <laughs> Who turns up in the first and third games. He will trap students in death traps and attempt to murder them. In fact, ghosts in general seem to want to kill him. But mostly it's just Peeves and the many ghosts of David Bowie. Overall, Hogwarts is a death trap that should be shut down. Not only are, these, are there these dangers, but pupils have to contend with the same dangers from the books and movies too. I think I'll just go to normal school. The food may be way worse. I can't do magic, but at least I won't get burned to death. Well, at least it's way less likely. The danger doesn't stop even when it's lesson time. So let's talk about lessons. I can't wait. Mm, me neither. The standard format for a lesson in the first three games, there aren't lessons in the fourth, we'll get to that later, is as follows. Harry gets a class. Harry usually doesn't find a place to sit down. The teacher will call him to the front, or in the third, and the third, him and his two friends. If it's the first game, you'll have to trace a one movement, which is inconsequential because you don't have to do it when you're casting spells in the game anyway. But all three games then send Harry to a dungeon to retrieve a spellbook. It's your turn to retrieve the Carpe Retractum spellbook. What follows is what can only be described as an Ofsted Inspector's worst nightmare. Firstly, it seems that only one student ever gets to learn a spell, as it's usually Harry, it appears it's usually the rich and famous, or those associated with him. However, it might be more fortuitous to not be Harry or his friends, as they now have to brave saw-like traps and puzzles to get to the spell. Like a trap from Saw, these lessons seem to be designed to maim and murder the participants. Fiery pits, beasts there to murder, flying spiky balls, the ghosts of David Bowie and Redcaps are only some of the dangers a student has to brave, 
And then, there's the boss fights. In the second game, it's usually a giant spell spewing gargoyle, but the third game diversifies with giant statues and flaming cauldron monsters. If the rampant pest infestations and dangers of the grounds wasn't enough to warn, you, warn against this educational institute, then maybe it's the fact that if you're not Harry Potter, you'll probably not learn anything. Even if you are Harry Potter, you'll probably get killed by a spell-spewing gargoyle or a fiery cauldron monster. Oh, and in the first game, I'm fairly sure Snape just tries to murder Harry. Hmm, that must be Disney. <laughs> Where am I? I mean, how was that even allowed? Life at Hogwarts, however, isn't all bad if you like jelly beans. Some may be flavoured like bogeys, though. But Utty Bot's every flavoured beans seem to be hidden in all sorts of locations at the school. Lying on the floor, hiding in vases and trophy shields, or they burst out of dead creatures like a piñata. But eating these beans isn't their only use, even though Harry seems to do both in the second game. According to friend George Weasley, they are the number one currency of Hogwarts. Anyway, welcome to our shop, Harry. Yes, feel free to browse our extensive range of wizard weasers and magical merchandise. Everything priced at reasonable rates and the only currency universally accepted throughout Hogwarts. Bertie bots every flavour beans. We're sure there's something here you'll like. And they're willing to take them off your hands in exchange for items, at least in the second and third game. In the fourth, the beans are still there, but are sacrificed to the ether for nebulous upgrades to your jinxing ability for some reason. No, what I want to talk about is the frankly bizarre use of Bertie Bot's beans in the first game. In this instance, Harry collects beans at the request of the Weasley twins for reward of the occasional wizarding card. We need the beans for some <clears throat> experiments. Here's a wizard card for you. You've earned it. <laughs> But this isn't what bothers me about these exchanges. It's the creepy way in which the Weasley twins accept these beans. We need the beans for some <clears throat> experiments. Here's a wizard for us. We need the beans for some <clears throat> experiments. Remember, you don't know anything about us collecting beans. It'll be our secret, right? It just flat out creeps me out. It either sounds like we're dealing them drugs, or helping some diabolically, plainly illegal experiment. At one point, we stumble across their stash of beans while doing a completely unrelated task. When we reveal ourselves to them, they don't even bat an eyelid at our sudden appearance in a secret chamber. They just ask for more beans! As if they expected us here all along. Hey Harry, do you have 25 beans for us? <laughs> That's it! That's all the beans we need! Thanks Harry, we couldn't have done it without you. Here's a wizard card for you, you've earned it. Thanks Harry, we really needed these. Remember, you don't know anything about us collecting beans. It'll be our secret, right? Come on, George. We've got work to do. I think most of the problem comes from their voices, which aren't as friendly and jovial as in later games, but instead come off way creepier. Also, I'm not sure what would happen if Harry didn't have the beans. Maybe they'd murder him. It would fit in with the rest of Hogwarts. What is the payoff I hear you crying with bated breath? Well, 
they stuff the beans and Snape's cupboard. And then they, uh, they explode out. It really doesn't seem worth it at all, to be honest. That weird story wrinkle brings us to the overall, the overall way in which the games deal with the story from the books and movies. It's clear that these games, while licensed movie games, didn't watch the movies beforehand, or had very small amounts of pre-release materials to go on. Harry, for example, wears the clothes he had at the end of the first movie for the first two games. Hogwarts stats a lot more like movie Hogwarts as the games go on, but it's clear they're going off trailers or something. The fourth game definitely had more to go on as the characters are modelled after the actors. Anyway, this goes towards the point that the games do not follow the movie plots at all, but draw more inspiration from the books plot-wise. In the first game, for example, the Norbert storyline plays out in a similar way to the books opposed to the movies. This creates a weird mix of the two, which I found pretty cool most of the time, to be honest. However, the games do take some liberties with the story, and also gloss over some parts of the story. In the first game, most of the story is whizzed through in narration and cartoon slideshows. So naturally, the whole school knows. The stone had been destroyed, but Harry remained fearful that its loss would not prevent Lord Voldemort's return. Dumbledore nodded, sharing his concern. And we pick, Harry, we pick up when Harry gets out of the sorting ceremony. The character of Dobby in the Chamber of Secrets was cut off together and his parts were given to the narrator. Side note, I love the narrator of the games. He gets all of Dobby's lines and I love to imagine that's what Dobby sounds like in the game universe. If Harry Potter goes back to Hogwarts, he will be in mortal danger. He's used to propel the story at certain points and while I feel there are better story ways to do this, I still love his whimsical voice for it was Lucius Malfoy who had planted Tom Riddle's diary on the hapless Ginny Weasley. The sped up nature of the stories is so extreme in the first two games, that I think that most of the first game happens on the one one day. Harry learns all of his spells, joins the Quidditch team. Gryffindor's first Quidditch match of the year is later this afternoon against the formidable Slytherin team. See you then. Helps Hagrid with no birth Norbert. Yeah, Harry. It's hatching. Ain't he lovely? I'll call him Norbert. He's a Norwegian Ridgeback, you know. And plays his first Quidditch game, and then goes to potions, all on the first day. And that first day also seems to be Halloween, as then we rescue Hermione from the troll in the bathroom that night. The second game condenses a year worth of action into roughly five days. Better than the first, but still way more rushed than it should be. There also appears to only be two victims of the battle, so making the story make way less sense. The third game goes some way to address this problem by showing the change of seasons in the grounds, becoming wintry early on and then going back to sp through spring and summer. The fourth game has so little story it's, worth, it's not worth discussing beyond the point that it had little story. In fact, there is little good to say about Goblet of Fire for the PS2. Let's start with a positive. This is the first of the Harry Potter games that attempted to be as close to the movies as possible. That means this is unmistakably the movie Hogwarts and the game's aesthetic is very tied to that. Mission Select, for example, is independent from the movies, and that's the actual Hungarian Horntail. These are nice moments for a fan of the movies like myself. That said, this game sucks the big ones. Let's start with the combat, which is a baffling, confusing mess. You spam the X button in the vague direction of enemies, there's no knowing what spell comes out. It could be Flapendo, it could be Avafors, it could be some weird balloon spell that turns your enemies into inflated versions of themselves. Who knows? I think there's meant to be combos that the player works out, but the only one I could figure out is Avafors. You stun an enemy, then you lift them, lift them in the air with Wingardium Leviosa, and then someone else has to attack it with the X stack, which is then suddenly Avafors. It's obtuse to the point of being unhelpful, and certainly impractical in the heat of battle. The game is like a top-down action RPG, 
this is so counter to what Harry Potter is, especially the fourth one, that it makes me wonder what the developers were thinking when they made this game. The game is based on getting these tri wizard shields, and to get to the next level you have to get the required amount of these shields to progress. As a result, you have to go back to the previous levels to get these shields, with new spells and areas unlocked. But the loading times are obtuse, the activity is repetitive and dialogue repeated again and again when you replay these levels. It makes what could have been a not bad idea into a truly hellish experience of monotony. Not even the tri wizard trials are fun. They take the form of an on-rail shooter, and they're as dull and counter to what Harry Potter is as the rest of the levels in the game. two games, while they have their flaws, were fun open world Hogwarts experiences, while this is just dull and boring and repetitive. After the second try was a task, the game wanted me to find 11 of the bloody shields. I rage quit. The only one of these games I did that to. Not even the Deathly Hallows games induced that amount of rage in me. And I didn't even feel slightly bad about it. In the end, I enjoyed my time with these games, Goblet of Fire notwithstanding. The games obviously have their problems, and none of them are must-haves, but they craft a truly pleasant Hogwarts experience. Hogwarts, on the other hand, is a dangerous and unforgiving place that would be more at home in a Saw movie, and it should most definitely be shut down. I hope you enjoyed our parade into the world of Harry Potter. Join me next week, where we'll be looking at the final games of the series, including some of the most infamous for truly being awful. Now for the end card. Uh, fuck it, have some dancing Harry memes. <laughs>